So uh, my name is Brent Price and I'm the administrator of the Moran Eye Center and it's really my pleasure today to be able to introduce to you this version of our Doc Talks. We do this frequently and we specialize or we have different specialties come in and talk about their interests, their results and uh, things that are happening in their area of, area of the medical field. And so really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Albert Vitale today. Uh, he is someone here at the Moran Eye Center that is deeply respected and loved by all of us. Uh, I was fortunate uh, in the early days, 15 years ago, to be involved in, in uh, helping get Dr. Vitale here to the University of Utah. Uh, his specialty is a really unique specialty, uveitis, and it's, a, it's certainly one that is unique in the Intermountain West. He has it, it, part of the design, I'd like to say, but Dr. Vitali brought the specialty here for us, and then since then has really built the Intermountain West specialty in uveitis, and it has been able to recruit some other wonderful providers, some that you may know, and uh, and we actually have another one who will be starting next month. So, and it's it's uh, a, a great. Uh, testimony to what Dr. Vitali has been able to build inside of our national circles and international circles, the University of Utah Moran Eye Center and the uveitis program, it has become recognized as one of the leading programs in the country. And when you say in the country, that means also in the world. So uh, Dr. Vitali is, of course, a retina specialist as well. And uh, I'm assuming many of you know him because you've been in his clinics and uh, in his partner's clinics. And we're just really glad to have you here. We're glad for your interest and we're, we hope that this uh, really is informative for you. And we know there are also families here. Um, a couple of things to know about Dr. Vitale that uh, I really appreciate is Dr. Vitale is really interested and concerned in our outreach program. What that means is taking health care to individuals who don't have good access to this health care. Uh, there's a 4th Street Clinic here in Salt Lake City, and when Dr. Vitali came, he introduced our residents, our medical students, himself going down to the clinic and volunteering their time. Uh, you know, we have probably one of the best ophthalmology outreach programs in the country where we go throughout the world, and uh, he's participated in those activities as well, a deep interest for him, and uh, we love what he brings uh, to us. You know, it's kind of like giving back to the community. And uh, we have a program that he participates in where we go monthly down to the Navajo Nation and uh, take health care to really that part of our state, we call it locally, that, uh, that needs it. Um, he helped introduce one of the things I'm very proud of here at the Moran Ice Center. You know, it's, it's quite glamorous to go throughout the world and these wonderful places like, like uh, Ghana or... Um, I'm trying to think, Al, you're going to recently, Myanmar, you got a program at Myanmar and uh, Mongolia, and, uh, but yet here locally we still have needs. And so Dr. Vitali was instrumental in putting together a program where uh, twice a year we're able to uh, bring into our center, into the Moran Eye Center, where the employees volunteer their time, the doctors and residents volunteer their time, and coordinate with even pharmaceutical companies. And we bring them into our, uh, we bring people who don't have access to care, couldn't pay for it, bring them here on a Saturday, and we line up uh, these surgeries on a Saturday for uh, indigent patients, patients who just don't have access to care, and we're able to provide that care. And uh, I love the fact that it's local and that we're giving back to the community, but also that it's easy for individuals here at the Brown Eye Center to, to um, participate and, uh, and not having to fly across the globe. So a couple of interesting facts about Dr. Vitale is, uh, is that he loves to ski. So hopefully you get to see him up on the mountain with his family. Uh, he also is, uh, plays the guitar. He's in a band, and the name of the band is um, it's all, it's UV, UV. <laughs> Vital Signs. So there you go. Uh, kind of the, do the life of a doctor and the personal life never really get disconnected. As you know, I was, as Dr. Vitali was preparing for this talk, he's on his cell phone taking care of a patient just m minutes ago. Um, and so 
that's the life of a doctor. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Vitali here at the Moran Eye Center. We're grateful for all that he does. And so please give him a warm welcome. Thank you very much, Brent, for that generous uh, introduction. Uh, really, I, I'm really... I forgot one thing, may I? Yes. Besides, course. he's taller than me, so <laughs> I didn't forget that part. Each of you have cards, comment cards, and so if you have questions, write them on your card. We'll push them over to this side of the table, and we'll have some individuals pick those cards up um, as we get to the point where you may have questions. Sorry, okay. No problem. Well, thank you once again. I'm, I, I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience. Um, some of you are retina patients, some of you are, are uh, uveitis patients. And th the topic of today's talk is really about inflammatory ocular disease, so the other hats that I wear, the uveitis kind of hat. So many of you may or may not be familiar with you know, an entertainer, a uh, rock star named Sting. He wrote a, he was a member of the police, he wrote a song in which one of the uh, lyrics was, uh, pour over everything in my CV and you still know nothing about me. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself uh, in addition to what Brent um, has told you. So in a previous lifetime, uh, before I came to uh, the Moran Eye Center, I was doing much of what I was doing here at the King Khalid Eye Specialist Hospital in Saudi Arabia. And I spent uh, seven years doing, doing that after I um, finished my fellowship training. Um, in actuality, uh, my real job title is wild animal trainer. Uh, this is my wife, and these are the four uh, wild animals that uh, I have had the pleasure of training um, throughout my lifetime. Here they are. Um, your, your, your eyes don't deceive you. These are actually the same age. They're triplets. This is uh, the older son who uh, was just uh, you know, a year and a half older. And this is the day that we decided to move to, uh, this is in Kennedy Airport, before embarking on a plane to Saudi Arabia. And I think my son here is kind of looking at me like, sure, you know what you're doing here, Dad? And he said, no, no, really, it, the, the, the housing is tremendous in Saudi Arabia. You're going to love it. Ultra modern, incredibly beautiful. And the sandboxes are just phenomenal. <laughs> and, uh, this is actually 45 minutes from our home. Uh, and uh, we used to go there regularly. It's, it's, weirdly uh, prescient of, of uh, southern Utah. Uh, anyhow, um, and this was my wife, um, who is, uh, was getting extremely good at juggling with four objects, a, a art that she is mastering uh, to this day. Um, and about six years into our journey there, um, I got a call from Ann Randy Olson uh, asking me if I would consider coming to Utah. I didn't have to think twice about that. And so I pitched the idea to my wife, and she's kind of like, here saying, now let me get this straight, okay? So you, you bring me to Saudi Arabia, okay? And you want me to go to Utah, <laughs> desert to desert, um, you know, religious fundamentalism to religious to conservatism, prohibitions on alcohol, and, and what is this with more than one wife? I, I don't get this, so. <laughs> I said, no, but seriously, the desert blooms there are, are absolutely more beautiful than they are in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. This is a view out of our front door um, down Immigration Canyon during the springtime. This is the view out our front door during the wintertime. Uh, you can see there are a few more houses there. Um, there was a day uh, when I, I used to say, follow me, guys, when we'd ski together as a family. And sure enough, here's my son uh, crossing eights, and we're getting buried in powder. The most feared words on the mountain these days for me are, Follow me, Dad. Uh, I, I, I'm long past the, uh, you know, the, t the time of getting upside down on skis. Um, if you, this is my son, Ryan, who is also a uh, competitive longboarder. If you want an interesting uh, YouTube video, look up When Reindeer Attack. Uh, it is a YouTube video that was taken purely by chance of him in a warm-up run colliding with a deer going about 45 miles an hour. Fortunately, both the deer and he are fine. My daughters are I actually accomplished equestrians. They, everybody seems to like speed or getting air in my family. Uh, my son and I are uh, surfing partners. We surf a lot down in uh, Mexico together. Um, and my brother uh, and I are also surfing partners. And uh, we share a similar passion for music. Uh, we, and we play together. Sometimes I sit in on his band. His band is The Vital Signs. My band used to be called Uvial Blues. <laughs> So this is uh, my family now. We, they've certainly grown in size, um, and uh, we've flourished here in Utah. This is my family getting wild. We also, it's grown in number. We have 
you know, our unofficial adopted uh, son, uh, nephew Kellen, uh, the black sheep of the family. And then <laughs> we also have a, uh, an extended, um, uh, extend, extended family here. You may recognize some of the people here is Dr. Shakur over Thanksgiving and one of our residents here. And then our kind of extended family in Mexico. So the, um, we're not quite empty nesters. Uh, the uh, two people that are living at home uh, are our dogs. Uh, Iggy and Zeus, and then my daughter, uh, Sophia. Uh, but my wife and I are still uh, doing fine and crazy after all these years. So today, the objectives of this talk is really to introduce you to a broad overview of the diagnosis and treatment of ocular inflammatory disease, okay? I would like to define it, try to give you an appreciation for the magnitude of the problem, our diagnostic approach, our treatment approach, including immunomodulation and new uh, therapies that are available, and then some important clinical trials that we have been involved in at the Moran Eye Center since I've been here. So what is uveitis? Uv the u uveitis per se, the, the definition, the uveal tract is actually the inner layer of the eye, inflammation of the inner layer of the eye, but when we talk about uveitis, it really refers to intraocular inflammation, inflammation inside the eye. And uveitis is not just one disease, but it's about, it's more than 30 separate diseases with defined clinical features with uh, specific treatment indications. They can be broadly thought of as either being infectious or not infectious, and many of them, the, the non-infectious ones, are of an auto-inflammatory or an autoimmune ideology. We also, uh, there are also <coughs> entities that simulate inflammation in the eye, such as uh, neoplasms or uh, uh, cancers in the eye. <coughs> It is the third leading cause of blindness worldwide, so this is not a small problem. Um, in the United States, it accounts for about 10 to 15 percent of blindness and is the fifth to sixth leading cause of blindness behind diabetes and age-related macular degeneration. The fact that this disease uh, has its peak onset uh, at, in the 30s and 40s uh, suggests that maybe the personal economic impact of uveitis may be even uh, worse uh, and greater than that of age-related diseases. How do we approach the patient with uveitis? It's, it's more like uh, uh, the experience that you have with your internist, okay? So that the history, both the ophthalmic and the medical history is extremely important in patients with uveitis. Sir William Osler, uh, the father of American medicine said, listen to your patient, he's telling you your diagnosis. So actually taking a good history, um, both in the clinic and by means of a questionnaire is very important. Then we conduct an ocular examination and a general medical examination to the extent that we can perform it in the clinic. Sometimes just looking at a patient's hands uh, or skin can give us some clues about uh, the diagnosis. Um, and then we formulate a differential diagnosis. This is the key to uh, diagnosis in patients with UVS. What are the likely diagnostic entities based on this information? So we generate a differential diagnosis by characterizing inflammation along several different dimensions where it is located in the eye, the anatomic location. What is the presentation? Is it acute? Is it chronic? Is it, is it one eye or both eyes? What do the lesions look like in the front of the eye or in the back of the eye? How many are there? And describe them. What are the host factors? That is, what are the things about the person? Are, is this part of a systemic disease entity that we know about in the patient? Or is it purely a disease that's confined to the eye? There are certain diseases such as sarcoidosis, um, that is a systemic disease. There are infectious systemic diseases such as syphilis or, uh, not, or uh, West Nile disease. Then the immunocompetence of the patient is, is key. Is the patient otherwise healthy or are they on medications that suppress their immune system to begin with or do they have a uh, immunosuppressive disease such as HIV AIDS? Then the demographics, that means where in the world are they from? You know, I mean, certain diseases are more common in certain parts of the world and with our shrinking uh, world these days with air travel and the fact that the uh, Moran Eye Center is a tertiary care referral center, this is quite important. And then the associated signs and the associated symptoms. So if you take a look at these pictures here, this is a, um, a rash uh, that is a, called erythema migrans and in the right clinical di uh, context, this is diagnostic of Lyme disease. Whereas this lady, her natural pigmentation is, is dark and she has vitiligo and uh, whitening of her eyelashes that is associated with a systemic illness called VKH or uh, Voigt-Kinyagi-Harada syndrome. Then, based on this information, 
we direct our laboratory tests and then formulate a treatment plan um, based, based on our, um, our laboratory uh, results and our diagnosis. Then we assess the treatment and monitor for side effects of toxicity. That's a broad overview of how we approach the patient. So when I first arrived here, I was fortunate enough to participate in a workshop called the Standardization of Uveitis Nomenclature, or the SUN Working Group, in which a group of uveitis experts from around the world got together and decided to agree upon what the, we're going to agree on what we call uveitis and how we're going to classify it. So to facilitate our communication together for research purposes and then uh, in the literature and then, of course, when we're talking to each other about inflammatory diseases. So we have classified, there are many ways to classify uveitis, but the way we have generally agreed to classify it is an, on an anatomic basis. That is, is the inflammation located primarily in the front of the eye, that we call anterior uveitis, or intermediate uveitis in which the inflammation is located in the vitreous gel of the eye in the peripheral retina, or posterior uveitis, which by definition involves inflammation of the retina and choroid, or panuveitis, where the inflammation exists throughout the eye in all three chambers. So to illustrate this, we can see this patient having a red eye with an inflammatory collection of material in the front of the eye, an anterior uveitis. This patient has intermediate uveitis. This is what we see when we look at the eye with these, cell, these accumulations of cells in the gel or the vitreous of the eye. This is a posterior uveitis a patient with toxoplasmosis with an active focus of inflammation of in, in the retina here. And this is a patient with VKH disease with uh, inflammation throughout the eye and, and an exudative retinal detachment. We also agree to uh, what we mean when we talk about acute and chronic disease. So an acute uh, illness is one that has a sudden onset <coughs> and, a, uh, and a limited duration. Um, recurrent disease um, are, are episodes that are marked by periods of inactivity, uh, arbitrarily defined as three months off of medication. And, re and chronic disease is inflammation that persists despite tapering off of medications. So I just thought I'd just run through, give you some examples and some pictures of the major anterior uh, uveitic diseases. So we can, again, classify them as, as infectious or those associated with um, uh, systemic disease. This is um, an example of a patient with herpetic uh, anterior uveitis. This is a patient with HLA-B27 associated disease. These patients will present with an acute onset with pain, redness, um, and uh, difficulty, uh, difficulty vision and photophobia, difficulty with lights. This is an accumulation of inflammatory cells in the front part of the eye. Contrast that to the more insidious and chronic onset of juvenile idiopathic arthritis-associated disease in this young child with a white eye with chronic inflammation, uh, which has resulted in this cataract. This is a patient with sarcoid-associated uveitis uh, with these deposits on the uh, cornea of the eye with a chronic uh, inflammatory course. And this is a patient with, you will notice, has two different colored irises. This is Fuchs heterochromic uh, iridocyclitis, which is a chronic disease. The major disease of intermediate uveitis, again, uh, uh, is inflammation centered in the gel of the eye and the peripheral retina, can be infectious or they can be part of a systemic condition. One sees inflammatory exudates in the peripheral retina and what is commonly called a snowbank. This is what we see when we look inside of the eye. Uh, visual acuity is frequently affected by leaking of, uh, blood from blood vessels in the center of the vision. This is a fluorescein angiogram, which shows leakage of dye in the center of the vision, so-called macular edema, which we'll talk about in a, a little bit more detail. These are the inflammatory exudates that we see in patients uh, with intermediate type of uveitis. We also frequently see patients with involvement of their blood vessels, so-called vasculitis. And this is um, seen also on fluorescein angiography. This is a new modality, a wide field fluorescein angiogram, which shows in very uh, magnificent detail uh, the involvement of the peripheral blood vessels. This is an, an indicator of active uh, inflammation in the eye. Posterior uveitis by definition involves inflammation either in the retina, such as this patient with, to with toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis, or in the choroid, which is the, the layer behind the retina, deeper to the retina, in this patient with tuberculous disease. 
It's important for us to uh, characterize the lesions, their morphology, the number, their location, whether or not they're involved in the uh, back of the eye or in the periphery. So some of the descriptors that we often use are amoeboid. If you see a patient with an amoeboid type of picture like this, this is characteristic of, of a disease entity that we call serpiginous <coughs> choroiditis. These lesions are flat. We call these placoid. This is characteristic of an inflammatory condition called AMPI, or acute posterior multifocal placoid posterior epitheliopathy. These are orange ovoid lesions that are characteristic of a, pa of a patient with birdshot retinochoridopathy. These are the more punched out lesions that are pigmented that are characteristic of a patient with multifocal choroiditis and panuviatis. And this patient has a scar near the center of the vision due to a choroidal nevascular membrane which can complicate this disease and decrease central vision. This you can hardly see the white dots here. And these are, this is part of an entity called multiple evanescent white dot syndrome. Beautiful name, isn't it? And the white dots are indeed evanescent. They come and they go. And uh, they, one may miss them and be just left with this kind of granularity in the, in the macula, in the back of the eye. The major diseases um, uh, of posterior vascular are listed here, both infectious uh, and non-infectious. This is a patient with a CMV retinitis, a viral condition that we see sometimes in immunocompromised patients uh, and in patients with HIV AIDS. This is a non-infectious uh, disease uh, of sarcoidosis with very bad involvement in the back of the eye, affecting not only the retina, the, uh, but the choroid and the gel and the red blood vessels. And this is a uh, peculiar white dot syndrome called relentless placoid choroidopathy, in which the inflammation starts from the periphery and has relentlessly kind of uh, involved the entire retina, fortunately for this patient sparing their central vision. And then there's panuvitis. The major disease is called panuvitis. You'll notice that syphilis and sarcoidosis are two uh, entities that are listed here because they are classically known as the great imitators. They can do anything they want. They can show up anywhere in the eye uh, and really present in any fashion. And this happens to be a patient with syphilitic uh, posterior chorderetinitis. This is an uh, example of a patient with voigt kanyagi hirata syndrome. I showed you the picture of the lady with the depigmented face. This was actually a young Saudi woman. And if, uh, to the trained eye, one can see that the details of the retina are obscured because there's fluid underneath the retina. Indeed, when we perform a fluorescein angiogram on this patient, we can see these large pockets of fluid that are characteristic of this disease. And then these are the lesions of a patient with sympathetic ophthalmia that had had surgery or rather had trauma in their fellow eye and unfortunately had developed an inflammatory condition in their better eye, a very unusual disease indeed. So we are in the business of vision as uveitis specialists and uh, vision, the best corrective vision, is really an important thing to assess when we uh, examine the patient. We assess their intraocular pressure and then we have come up with a, uh, a kind of a standardized way to grade the inflammation. And I'd just like to show you what we see when we look in the eye in a patient with inflammation. So these are cells in the anterior chamber. You may hear me say are there are there are one plus, two plus, three plus cells in the anterior chamber, and we grade them according to the number of cells that we can identify in a slit beam uh, when we examine the eye. And we grade it accordingly. Similarly, we grade flare. Flare is due to leakage of protein in patients with chronic uveitis in the anterior chamber, and it's very similar to the shafts of light that you see after a rainstorm, or uh, some of you may remember going to a movie theater and having someone smoke in the movie theater and seeing these shafts of light due to particulate matter in the air. So the particulate matter is protein in the eye, and flare is actually graded to the degree to which it obscures the structures in the front part of the eye. Similarly, when we look into the back of the eye, we get a, a large a picture of the posterior aspect of the eye. This is the optic nerve and the blood vessels coming off of here. And this is a very clear view. We can see the structures very clearly. But in patients with uh, intraocular inflammation in the back of the eye, that can become progressively more obscured depending upon the degree of inflammation in the eye. So we grade it on a scale of zero to four plus to the degree to which it obscures the structures in the eye. So why do we work patients up with laboratories? Well, it's very important to exclude infections. We don't want to treat a patient with an infection 
with a steroid medication, which would make an infection worse. Then we want to identify systemic diseases they may, that may impact on the health of our patients. And I'll show you some examples of that. And then this will guide appropriate treatment as to whether or not we use a, a steroid or an immunomodulator or an uh, antimicrobial medication. And then to provide some prognostic information for the patient, because not all inflammation is the same in the eye. The workup is selective based upon our history and our review of systems. Uh, we start from uh, the more common to the more rare. We always consider the masqueraders, such as syphilis, sarcoid, and TB in our differential diagnosis, because these are, um, syphilis is a disease that everybody is, is at risk for if you're alive, uh, and we can cure it with penicillin. Uh, and then we always consider masquerade syndromes. What I mean by masquerade syndromes are those uh, uh, entities that simulate inflammation but are actually not inflammatory, but they are uh, due to cancers or lymphomas or, or other um, vision-threatening and then life-threatening uh, entities in the eye. Sometimes it's, uh, we perform a, a very targeted uh, screen. For example, if we see something like this in the eye, this is called neuroretinitis. We see that the optic nerve is involved and there are these, what we call a macular star. You get these exudates dates around the center of the vision. This is characteristic of neuroretinitis and we know, statistically speaking, that the most common cause of neuroretinitis is an infectious agent due to Bartonella, the group of uh, bacteria called Bartonella, which is responsible for cat, scra cat scratch disease. Similarly, if we see these kind of, uh, these punched out lesions in a patient uh, in September that has had a uh, episode of encephalitis and they're diabetic, we, would, we might think of West Nile virus because that's the time of year that that comes. And this is very characteristic of West Nile virus. And then if we see a patient, for example, with these necrotizing lesions in their peripheral retina that coalesce, we would certainly want to get a sample of uh, fluid from the front part of the eye because this is a viral infection that can destroy the eye quickly. We don't routinely screen patients for some of these agents such as viruses and toxoplasmosis uh, because they have a very high prevalence in the, in the population. So we don't take the blood to look for that. But we target it based upon what we're seeing in the eye. Um, if we took 100 patients that came in with isolated anterior uveitis that was acute, 50% of those patients would be positive for this gene, HLA-B27. Uh, and the importance of that is that HLA-B27 is associated with an immune response gene. But it is also uh, associated with um, a group of uh, diseases that cause arthritis, uh, particularly in young people. So if we can, and about uh, two-thirds of patients that present with anterior uveitis will have an undiagnosed arthritis. So when we're, we see a patient, that has this, we will screen for that and we'll ask them uh, in our history, do you have back pain, have you, do you have skin lesions and things like that, and if they do, we send them to a rheumatologist uh, because the uh, treatment, the systemic treatment that we can offer that patient may uh, prevent that patient from having uh, severe deforming arthritis later on in their life. Sarcoidosis is a disease you've all probably heard of. It is an inflammatory granulomas disease, can infect almost any organ in the body. Um, usually the most common organs affected are the lungs, the skin, the lymph nodes, and the eye. And in, in about 25% of patients with sarcoidosis may have uveitis, and it may look like these nodules in the front part of the eye or this very uh, severe inflammatory uh, picture that I showed you earlier. So we work patients up for specific um, I, for specific laboratories that may help us in the diagnosis of sarcoidosis, but this only gives us a clue because the diagnosis of this condition is really one of exclusion and requires a biopsy. Um, chest x-ray is a very useful screening test for patients with sarcoidosis because they have characteristic changes in their lungs and, uh, if, and they also have characteristic changes on CT scan. But the definitive diagnosis is a diagnosis of exclusion and shows these, the cystopathologic alteration. Um, and the most common place that this may, may be, may be in the lungs, but we also look for other sites that may not be as invasive, such as the skin or underneath the eyelid, where we might actually obtain a biopsy, make a diagnosis, and save a patient a trip to, um, to bronchoscopy. So we also perform imaging, uh, such as MRI scanning on patients that may have systemic conditions uh, that 
may masquerade as uh, or be involved in inflammation such as tuberculosis and lymphoma. Uh, this is a patient that has uh, swelling of their parotid gland with sarcoidosis. Uh, in patients in which we do have no view into the back of the eye, we can perform ultrasound on their eye to get an idea of what's going on in the back of the eye. Certainly this patient has all these large choroidal masses in the back of the eye. This is a patient you don't want to have a surgical adventure in uh, until you know it's back in the back of their eye. Fluorescein angiography is an extremely sensitive and valuable modality uh, in which we inject dye into a peripheral vein and take a series of photographs into the back of the eye and look at the vascular pattern that is produced here. You can see that there's leakage here uh, around the blood vessels um, and in patients with the inflammation in the eye, many patients will have leakage of their blood vessels and, and it can be used very uh, well uh, diagnostically in certain, in certain uh, conditions and it can also uh, be helpful for us in terms of monitoring the response to treatment. There's another uh, imaging modality called ICG angiography, which actually looks at it layer deeper than the retina. So in uh, entities in which the choroid uh, is involved, such as tuberculosis, or uh, in patients with deep lesions, such as birdshot retinal choroidopathy, we see these defects in the back of the eye, which can be very helpful diagnostically and in terms of following the patient in time. The, this is an anatomic picture of the back of the eye as seen by OCT, ocular coherence tomography, which has kind of been a game changer in our assessment of patients both retinal diseases and uh, with ocular inflammatory disease because it can provide us with quantitative real-time informa information in a non-invasive fashion. So it's just like going to have a picture taken. This is a normal appearing uh, retina in the back of the eye. This is clearly abnormal, which has a lot of clear spaces and swelling both under the retina and within the retina, and we can actually quantify the amount of swelling that's there. Sometimes the swelling is not due to inflammation, but it could be due to pulling on the retina from the gel of the eye. So this has given us a lot of it can give us a lot of information about why there's swelling in the back of the eye. It also gives us an idea of what the layers of the retina look like back here that can help us uh, tell the patient why they might be having visual loss. Finally, there is a, a newer modality called autofluorescence, uh, which gives us an idea of what's happening in the pigment epithelium, which is the layer on which the retina rests. Certain types of inflammatory disease will produce these atrophic black areas uh, on autofluorescence, and sometimes they may produce these brighter areas, which suggest there may be active inflammation in those areas. So these are clues that help us decide on what's active, what's not, what needs to be treated, and then how we can follow patients in time. So a lot, a lot of what I've shown you is kind of pattern recognition, and certainly retina specialists depend a lot on pattern recognition making their diagnosis. But look at these two slides here. I mean, things aren't always what they appear to be, right? Okay, so to a trained uh, uveitis specialist or retina specialist, if we looked at this in the right clinical context, we would make the diagnosis of toxoplasmic retinocorditis without ordering a laboratory test. Similarly, if a patient with HIV AIDS entered my clinic and had this picture, we would make a diagnosis of CMV retinitis. However, if an immunosuppressed patient came in and had a picture like this, I couldn't tell whether or not that was toxoplasmosis or whether it was due to an infection, uh, due to a bacteria, uh, whether or it was due to a viral infection. Similarly, in this uh, particular uh, case, uh, in an older patient, uh, with these types of uh, infiltrates underneath their retina, we cannot tell whether or not that's due to an infection uh, or due to uh, an infiltrate from, say, for example, lymphoma. So uh, we can't just tell by looking. So we need a little bit more information. And sometimes it's, it's necessary to actually obtain tissue from the eye, inside the eye, or in the retina and the core in order to make that determination. So we have to biopsy the, the fluids from the eye or the tissue of the eye. And it is uh, extremely important uh, when the clinical presentation is insufficient to make the diagnosis or it's atypical or if the patient hasn't responded to therapy in the way that you think that they might have. So for example, you might give a patient some steroids and they get worse. And the first thing that I would think about is maybe they have an, an infection that I've missed. So we have to, uh, it's extremely uh, helpful in patients with sus suspected intraocular infection or suspected intraocular malignancy because of the biopsy has uh, the power to really alter your management of that patient. 
because the treatment of those things is completely different. And how do we do that? Well, we can take a sample from the front part of the eye. We can uh, take a sample from the gel of the eye with just a needle, which we do sometimes uh, on an emergent basis in a patient that may have had uh, an infection after an operation from their eye. And then there are other times in which we perform a vitrectomy uh, in the operating room that gives us um, a controlled removal of the gel from the eye and allows us to take large samples, for example, when the differential diagnosis is very broad and we have to order uh, a number of tests in order to try to narrow the diagnosis. So just, we're, we're halfway there, okay? So that's the diagnostic approach. Just to recap, we do a comprehensive medical examination and review of systems, okay? We uh, do a complete ocular examination and a medical examination to the extent that we can do it. And then we form a differential diagnosis, the key. Then we order laboratory tests and ancillary investigations based upon this information, make, make a uh, diagnosis and have a working diagnosis. What, do we want, what are the goals of treatment? Well, we want to eliminate inflammation. That's the key. We want to eliminate inflammation to control uh, acute activity that can destroy the eye quickly, promptly. We want to suppress chronic and recurrent disease and hopefully induce a remission of this disease in the patient. This is all in an effort to uh, prevent ocular structural <laughs> damage to the eye, which can impair vision. We want to do all of this and to avoid uh, side effects and systemic complications to the patient. So we want to have our cake and we want to eat it at the same time. <laughs> and I think it's possible to do this in most cases. So what's the approach? Well, we have a working diagnosis. There are certain diseases in which we, there are specific indications for therapy. So if we have an infectious disease, we treat it with an antibiotic. If we have a non-infectious disease, we employ a step ladder algorithm, which I'm going to describe to you in more detail. Um, and there are certain diseases that are non-infectious for which we have specific treatments for. But we always, in the back of our minds, are willing to reconsider our diagnosis because patients may have an atypical response to treatment or new findings may emerge which may change your mind about the, about the um, diagnosis. Patient, patients' eyes don't always read textbooks, okay? And, uh, you know, so, um, so things change in time. So this algorithm, I hate the word algorithm because it implies that this is what we do all the time, but in general, this is, this is our approach. And our approach is to use steroids for patients that don't that patients that don't have inf infection in their eye to use steroids by every route that we possibly can uh, to suppress inflammation. So topical steroids, that is drops for anterior uveitis, periocular st and intravitreal steroids, that is injectable steroids in and around the eye, systemic steroids if we need to do that, steroid sparing immunomodulatory therapy, which I'll talk to you about, both conventional and, the, and employing newer biological agents. And then sometimes we perform we need to perform ocular surgery both diagnostically and then therapeutically for the complications that may arise from chronic inflammation in the eye. So the route and the, tr and the choice of treatment are really determined by where the inflammation is located in the eye, okay, the ocular complications that we see, and the systemic health of the patient. So if a patient has purely anterior uveitis, topical steroids or drops will suffice. The exception to that is children with idiopathic uh, arthritis that have chronic disease. Topical steroids will not penetrate to the back of the eye, so for patients with intermediate and posterior pancreatitis, we have to employ a different route. So we need to inject steroids either in or around the eye or use systemic corticosteroids or implantable devices, which I'm going to show you about. So as far as topical steroids are, are, are concerned, we use them frequently, we try to get a response, and then we taper uh, once we have a response. Frequently, we'll put patients on a dilating drop, a cycloplegic, because this helps with uh, comfort uh, in the, for patients with anterior uveitis. And also, we attempt to move the pupil so that the iris does not become stuck to the lens in the back of the eye. Periocular steroids means injectable steroids in or around the eye. Um, and this can provide local drug delivery for about three months. The indications for this would be the ideal patient would have an acute and remitting intermediate posterior or panuveitis. That is, um, it has defined periods of activity and non-activity. And the ideal patient would have, would have unilateral disease, so you only need to inject one eye, 
or in patients with swelling in the back of the eye, which I'll talk to you about a little bit more. So how can we inject the steroids? We can inject it underneath the eye through the, uh, in the orbital floor. We can inject it on the surface of the eye, as depicted here. We can inject it into the eye, such as an intravitreal steroid, as you see here. And then uh, there's a company that's come up with a kind of fancy method for injecting dexamethasone, this uh, so-called Ozerdex implant, uh, implantable device that injects a pellet of a steroid into the back of the eye. All of these are effective for a while in treating inflammation in the eye. The problem with steroid administration, particularly frequent topical steroids or injectable steroids, is the ocular complications that can arise, including cataract and glaucoma, which do happen eventually if steroids are given often enough in patients. The, uh, the problem therapeutically is also that it is relatively uh, short-acting, so it would be a less effective choice for a patient with a chronic disease, right? It is uh, helpful as an adjunctive uh, measure for patients that may be having a flare-up or may have uh, edema in their eye, but there is subtle structural damage with each relapse, with cumulative damage, uh, with inflammation at each time a steroid might be injected. So you might be missing the opportune time to, to treat the patient. Plus, there's the cumulative risk of steroid exposure that I just mentioned within, in terms of cataract and uh, intraocular pressure rise. So some very clever people got together and said, well, why don't we just kind of design a device that we can implant into the eye uh, that will release steroids for three years? Okay, so such a device has, has been devised and approved by the FDA, the so-called Redisert implant. This is the implant. This was actually modeled on the Vitrocert implant, which was initially uh, used for treatment of patients with CMB retinitis in the AIDS epidemic. So this device is surgically implanted into the eye in the operating room and releases flucinolone acetonide, which is a uh, long-acting uh, medium potency steroid, for about three years. It is very effective in uh, suppressing inflammation, uh, as, as has been shown in studies that led to its approval by the FDA, but it has frequent adverse uh, effects, ocular effects, as expected. So most patients will develop cataract, 100% of patients will develop cataract, and many patients will have elevated pressure in the eye that need treatment uh, medically, and about 40% of those, at least in this trial, needed actually uh, incisional glaucoma surgery in order to manage their problem. There is another device with the same steroid that, is being, that has been developed and has been approved for the, for the treatment of macular edema, that is swelling in the eye, uh, uh, due to diabetic disease, the so-called alluvian implant, and we think that it will also be approved for the treatment of non-infectious uveitis. The advantage to this approach is that it's a, it's a lower dose of this steroid medication, and it can be uh, injected in the office rather than taking the patient to the operating room. Other uh, injectable medications in the eye, uh, people have thought, well, gosh, you know, steroids have all these bad side effects. Let, why don't we use medications that are non steroidal and see if they are effective? One such medication that we use systemically is methotrexate that uh, has actually been shown to be quite effective in treating uh, inflammation in the eye and in macular edema. Um, ranibizumab is, uh, and uh, Lucentis or Avastin uh, are uh, medications that have been used uh, frequently in patients with edema due to vein occlusions and, and macular degeneration, and they have also shown, been shown to be effective in patients with swelling in the back of the eye due to macular edema in patients with uveitis. Some patients you cannot treat with just local in, uh, injections. Patients with bilateral severe disease require more sustained um, systemic therapy, and they require system, uh, therapy with systemic corticosteroids. Systemic corticosteroids, prednisone, is the mainstay of treatment of patients with non-infectious uveitis. And um, it is usually uh, administered orally uh, at high dose until inflammation uh, starts to get better and then it is tapered, okay. that we taper it off. But we also supplement patients with calcium and vitamin D and we monitor them closely because there are many side effects that are associated with a systemic corticosteroids, which I think, in my opinion, are manageable most of the time if we keep an uh, eye on patients. So these are the, if you, it's a scroll, a long list of side effects, but I think that many of these side effects are certainly manageable uh, if we have a, a defined uh, period of time in which we're using these medications. 
We do not want patients to be on corticosteroids for a long period of time because we know that the um, long-term side effects of chronic corticosteroids are not good uh, for patients for, for all of those reasons, reasons that we just um, cited. So what do we do for patients that have inflammation that, uh, in which you know, they respond to steroids, uh, but you can't get them uh, off of steroids or you can't get them to an acceptably low dose? Well, you have to give them an alternative medication. That's where we use immunomodulatory therapy. And this very important paper back in uh, 2000 uh, were actually guidelines for the use of immunomodulation. Um, failure of systemic corticosteroids, unacceptable side effects of steroids, or disease known to be poorly responsive to steroids, and we'll talk about that in a minute, or the requirement for chronic steroids at a dose of greater than 7.5 milligrams uh, per day. So those are kind of the guidelines that we use. What is immunomodulatory therapy? Well, immunomodulatory therapy, by definition, is systemic therapy that modifies some limb of the immune system. So it modifies, it dampens the immune response by a variety of mechanisms uh, interfering with DNA or protein synthesis or interfering with certain types of receptors or signals, uh, cellular signals in the eye that are responsible for inflammation. The, uh, this uh, expert group decided that there were certain, recommended that there are certain diseases for which immunomodulatory therapy should be commenced at the outset of the diagnosis. And those disease entities are listed here because we know that those patients will either do very, very poorly with steroids alone or they have a, um, an underlying systemic disease that require it uh, and that uh, you, you may be actually saving this patient's life, such as a patient with Wegener's granulomatosis that has uh, inflammation in their eye. There are a whole group of other other diseases that we know um, require long-term therapy, and that the option of having long-term therapy with systemic corticosteroids is probably not how you want to treat these patients, so you have a very low threshold to treat those patients with mm -hmm. immunomodulation in addition to corticosteroids. And they are listed here, such as birdshot and multifocal choroiditis, and, so, and certain children with, immuno, with uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. So what are these medications? Some of you may be familiar with them because maybe some of you have been on them. We uh, can classify them into large groups, the anti-metabolites such as methotrexate, mycophenolate or Celsept or azathioprine. Then there are the T-cell or calcineurin inhibitors such as cyclosporin and tacrolimus. And then there are more potent agents such as the alkylating agents such as chloramicil and cyclophosphamide which are used less frequently today because of the very serious side effects that can be associated with these medications and because we now have uh, biological agents that um, uh, may work uh, just as well as these medications. So the principles of treatment with these uh, medications, we individualize it to the patient, okay? Based upon their diagnosis and the systemic disease associations, uh, the age and sex of the patient, their medical status, their visual prognosis, we don't want to treat patients with no prognosis for vision. Um, the access and cost of the medications and the, and the patient preferences. So how do we go about using conventional immunological therapy? Well, we, ha we treat the acute inflammation with steroids, okay, to get the inflammation under control. The analogy would be if you have a fire, you want to use a fire hose, not a squirt gun, in order to, to dampen the inflammation. But you want to keep the fire out as you taper off of steroids or you take the fire hose away and that's where immunomodulatory therapy comes in. So we usually begin them simultaneously. Um, we need to know the response times for these, of these medications because the uh, immunomodulating med medicines that I mentioned to you, the conventional agents, take about two to three months to become active so that we want patients to be protected with steroids. While we're tapering the steroids coming down, the immunomodulatory medication may become active. We monitor the patients clinically at each visit for any signs of toxicity. We perform laboratory evaluations on the patients depending upon the medication that they are on so that they don't develop any uh, untoward side effects of the medication so that we can adjust their dose or stop the medication if they're developing a problem with medicine. There was a very important clinical trial that many, that some of your, some of the patients here uh, and in my clinic participated in, the MUST trial which was a randomized controlled clinical trial involving 24 centers that studied 
this implant device that releases steroids for three years versus the uh, use of conventional immunomodulatory therapy that I just described to you. And the results of this were very interesting because at two years, it seemed though the visual outcome between the two were about the same. But in the implant group, they seemed to achieve a faster uh, and better control of inflammation, which was statistically more significant. However, by seven years, and this, this, uh, this information was just published, there was clearly an advantage visually in patients that had had systemic therapy over the implant. Um, and uh, there was also a more favorable outcome in terms of inflammatory control. And I think that this um, uh, had to do with the fact that the implant itself started to actually uh, lose efficacy by about year five. So the implant uh, seemed to control inflammation a little bit longer than we had anticipated, but by year five, patients that had implants in their eyes began to have more recurrence of inflammation. The uh, good news is that overall there was a visual favorable outcome in both treatment arms. This just graphically represents the fact that here you have the implant and the systemic treatment arms and then initially there was, it seemed to favor the implant but by five years they the became less significant and by, uh, sev by seven years there was an advantage to the patients that had the systemic treatment. The ocular complications of the implant versus systemic were pretty predictable. That is, patients that had implants had cataracts and glaucoma surgery, as we had predicted before. But the good news in patients with, in terms of systemic adverse events was that the immunomodulatory therapy was tolerated way better than anybody had anticipated before. The major statistically significant finding from this was that patients that were treated with these medications seemed to have more um, antibiotic-treated infections, which is kind of understandable. If patients on methotrexate and they develop a cough, the doctor might write them a prescription for an antibiotic. But there were no really serious uh, consequences of treating patients with systemic therapy. So this group, the MUST research group, uh, has formed a research consortium uh, internationally, of which I'm a member and a member of the executive committee, and we have come up with important questions to ask about the treatment of patients with intraocular inflammatory disease. One of which is how to treat patients with uveitic macular edema, what is the um, role of therapeutic uh, vitreoretinal surgery, and uh, the use of other biological agents. Uh, macular edema, as I told you before, is uh, the leading cause of acute decrease of central vision in patients with inflammation. Here is a normal macula. This is a fluorescein angiogram showing the cystic spaces, and this is the uh, swelling of the retina that we see in patients with macular edema. You know, it's very, very common. In this, in this large database that I showed you, you know, well over a third of patients had macular edema at, when they entered the study. And uh, about 62, about 40 percent of the patients 40% uh, of those patients had not resolved in two years. So it can be a, a persistent problem and it can be a recurrent problem. So how do we treat macular edema? Well, we try to control the uveitis. We treat the patients to control their intraocular inflammation. We uh, uh, um, advise patients on modifiable risk factors such as smoking, which we know is about fourfold, confers a fourfold increased risk of macular edema. And then we use these adjunctive regional steroids, these injectable steroids into the eye, um, as adjunctive therapy in patients with, that are even on systemic therapy. We are in the process of performing two um, uh, randomized controlled trials which, my colleague, with, which I and my colleagues have actually designed. Uh, the first is called the POINT study, which has just been concluded, and that study looked at, um, compared, uh, tried to find out what is the best initial treatment for patients with uveitic macrogenia. Is it periocular steroids underneath the eye, or is it an injection of steroids into the eye, or is it an injection with that pellet that I described? We don't know the answer yet. We just concluded that one. In patients that have had previous exposure to an intravitreal steroid, to an injection of steroid into their eye, if they have a recurrence of their edema or persists, what we, what we have to offer the patient these days is just another steroid injection, and we know that those additional steroid injections can confer risk in terms of cataract and glaucoma to the patient. So the second trial is to look at what offers the best balance of efficacy and safety um, among three different options with repeated intravitreal injections. Either a Osirdex implant, that fancy device that I showed you, 
um, or intravitreal anti-VEGF, ranibizumab that I uh, talked to you about before, or intravitreal methotrexate. Both of these are non-steroidal, okay, not steroids, uh, alternatives that we think are equally as effective as, as steroids. So we'll be awaiting those studies, and some of you are participating in that study. So the other, um, the other type of therapy that has really uh, expanded our um, uh, therapeutic armamentarium are the emergence of biological response modifiers, biological agents. These are therapeutic proteins that are bioengineered as antagonists to immunoreactive molecules. That is, to molecules in the immune system that are specifically associated with inflammation in the eye. So they block the cytokines and receptors and cell surface proteins. And the idea is to provide specific, more targeted therapy that hopefully would result in less generalizable side effects that you might see in a patient, for example, on systemic corticosteroids. This is a long list of some of the uh, biological response modifiers that we currently use that are uh, available to us in the clinic, and they target different receptors in the eye. It's not important to know all what these are, but the ones that you're probably the most familiar with or may have heard about are the so-called TNF alpha inhibitors. TNF alpha is a molecule that is very important uh, in the inflammatory cascade. So blocking that molecule might dampen the, the inflammatory response. And the two medications that are used most frequently in intraocular inflammation are infliximab, or Remicade, and alimumab, or Humira. Remicade, infliximab, is a monoclonal antibody that is a, that is a bioengineered as a combination of a mouse and a human antibody. Okay? and is delivered by intravenous infusion, basically on a monthly basis, as opposed to Humira or adalimumab, which is a fully humanized molecule that is administered subcutaneously, often by the patient themselves, every two weeks. Um, there was an uh, important opinion paper uh, uh, about uh, the use of uh, anti-TNF agents in patients with uh, uh, uveitis, and this, uh, paper, this paper culled the literature and concluded that infliximab and adalimumab, or remicating humera, biological agents, are recommended as first-line agents for certain patients with Bechet's disease, an uncommon disease here, but a blinding disease uh, in parts of the world where it, where it is endemic. It is also, they are also very important second-line agents in patients that, that fail conventional immunomodulatory therapy, particularly children, with juvenile idiopathic arthritis associated inflammatory ocular disease, or in patients that have other uh, posterior segment inflammatory disease that fail conventional immunomodulation, so that we can actually um, uh, advance them to these therapies. So Remicade is one of those medications that uh, uh, is, is used um, in rheumatology uh, frequently. We use it at higher doses and more frequent infusion intervals than the rheumatologists do. Uh, Humira is a, uh, another agent that is potentially effective treatment option, um, and uh, the, the word about Humira is that it's been recently approved in April of 2016 by the FDA for use in uveitis specifically. So there were, two visual, there were two trials that we participated in as well at the Moran Eye Center, the Visual 1 and Visual 2 trial, um, that uh, led to the first FDA uh, approval of uh, a biological agent for uveitis. This is a big deal uh, for patients uh, with uveitis, uh, and because most of the agents that I've discussed with you are used off-label. That is, there is no FDA indication for their, their use, although it is the standard of care. So this medication has been shown to be useful in both patients with active disease and then in preventing uh, patients to having recurrent disease while we're tapering them off of steroids. Are TNF inhibitors completely safe? Well, you know they're not. Uh, they uh, do, we do know that they are associated with an increased risk of infection, so that any patient that is placed on these medications is screened thoroughly for infections, particularly tuberculosis. Uh, there is a reported increased risk of lymphoma associated with some of these medications, but usually among patients that have systemic conditions that, for which they are already at increased risk for, these, for lymphoma, such as patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And then, of course, we use them with caution in patients that have risk of demyelination. That is, patients that are at risk for developing multiple sclerosis. And in one of the entities that I showed you, 
uh, intermediate uveitis associated with pars planitis. In a certain subgroup of those people, they are at risk for developing, they are more at risk for developing multiple sclerosis. So we use these agents with caution in that group of patients. Um, there is a variable response to this, these medications. It is not a magic bullet. It is, does not cure uveitis. There are some patients that are not responders. Sometimes the response kind of wanes in time. And there are treatment-related side effects for which we need to, uh, uh, which we need to decrease the, uh, we need to discontinue the medication. So there are alternative medications within the same class. And then there are third-line biologics um, that I have mentioned to you before that target different receptors for which there is less experience, but we do use uh, in patients with, re with uh, recalcitrant disease. So does it work? Well, I think it does work. The MUST trial seven-year results, I think, show that this approach does, is effective. And then, specifically in patient young, youngsters with juvenile-associated arthritis-associated iridocyclitis, um, there's a definitive reduced risk of ocular complications um, in patients that are managed with these medications um, with uh, improvement of visual acuity with effective immunomodulation. In a, very recent, in a fairly recently re uh, reported uh, study, the SITE study, which looked at five very large university uveitis practices, there was a significant decrease in the risk for visual loss in patients treated with immunomodulation. Um, is uh, immunomodulatory therapy completely safe? Well, for certain uh, classes of medications, the anti-metabolites and T-cell inhibitors, we think that there is no increased risk of, of malignancy or mortality. Uh, there is a slightly increased risk for non-melanotic skin cancers, which we advise patients about. The alkylating agents, like, like cyclophosphamide, we know is associated with an increased risk of malignancy. Um, and then what about these TNF inhibitors? Well, um, this large study that I, I cited before called the SITE data suggests there may be an increased signal for mortality associated with these agents, but there are other large databases um, in other diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis that do not show an increased risk of cancer. So the jury is out because these are relatively new agents and we must monitor patients very closely. So how do we modify the prognosis of this potentially blinding disease? I think effective and early suppression of intraocular inflammation the early introduction of steroid sparing immunomodulation, and the identific identification of eyes at risk for complications of visual loss. There are multiple treatment options which need to be individualized to the patient and their disease. We need to have continued po vigilant post-marketing uh, surveillance and more, and more randomized controlled trials to see which patients would benefit most from biological agents and from immunomodulatory therapy, and of course continued areas of active research in terms of the immunologic mechanisms of UVS, so that we can design drugs that are specific for their inflammation, the development and application of targeted non-steroidal drug therapies that we talked about before, such as individual methotrexate, new drug delivery systems, there are many of them out there, such as nanoparticles and microparticulate, and then, then driving molecules across the eye with electrical current, and then finally the role of uh, therapeutic vitrectomy in uveitis. You know, they say that I started my uh, talk out, you know, describing my family to you. Uh, they say that it takes a village to raise, um, you know, a child. I think it takes moving to Saudi Arabia to raise triplets. But um, I think that I just wanted to acknowledge um, my colleagues uh, in the UVITIS team. It really takes a really excellent team, actually, to, mon to ma manage patients with UVITIS. Um, for a long time, for about 12 years, I was the only provider of UVITIS in the Intermountain West. In 2015, Dr. Akbar Shakur joined me, which enabled us to greatly expand our clinical capacity in seeing patients, uh, our ability to uh, become involved in many of these research protocols, and then to develop a teaching program and a uveitis fellowship program to train the next generation of pa experts in intraocular inflammatory disease. Dr. Marissa Lara Shell was our first fellow last year, and she will be joining our faculty on October 1st. This is our very talented uh, fellow this year, Lynn Hassman. The care of uh, patients is not just the doctors. In fact, it, may, it goes way, way beyond that. Um, the uh, ophthalmic lead techs are instrumental in caring for the patient while they're in the clinic. I know many of you spend very many long hours in the clinic. Uh, and then in calling in on the clinic uh, to get information. Uh, these are our UVI's team leaders past, Diana Ramirez and Candice Garcia. Our very talented team uh, of uh, UVA's team leaders, Henry Barrera 
Emily Peterson, Amanda Dickey, and uh, Marisa Mon. And then the people that you meet when you, when you come in, okay? Uh, Carlos and Steven couldn't do it without with Carlos, with the, these guys, you know, managing people up at the front end, banging down the doors to get into our clinic. And then once you're finally in there, you meet this, these, these guys, the imagers, the very talented imagers that we have here, led by Jim, uh, Jim Gilman, Melissa, Danielle, Becky, uh, and Glenn Jenkins. So it wouldn't also be impossible for me to do any of this without the administrative everything of Stephanie Stevens, um, who uh, is, uh, keep, plugs the left side of my brain when it needs plugging. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. So the first two of these questions are really retina-related questions that um, are not specific to the talk that I gave to you. Um, one of them has to do with the treatment of central retinal vein occlusion. Um, I, and I, central retinal vein occlusions uh, utilize these anti-VEGF anti, uh, anti medications. Um, and unfortunately, you know, sometimes I, it requires monthly injections with these medications. What we try to do is um, treat the patient until the swelling in their eye goes down till it's zero, and then extend the interval out to find what the sweet spot is where they no longer have um, uh, swelling in, the, in their eye, and then try to extend it out so that they no longer require it. But, um, but sometimes patients will require uh, treatment for many years. I know that answers uh, Carl's question. Um, I think, can you obtain all the lutein and zeaxanthin from food? I think you can, but you have to eat a very well-balanced diet. Uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, there is the AREDS-2 vitamin supplement for patients with moderate macular degeneration that is uh, actually uh, recommended for patients with that, which gives you the um, recommended uh, amount of uh, lutein and zeaxanthin in a single pill. So I think it's easier rather than, uh, you know, having to, you know, have a uh, large a whole bunch of leafy green vegetables sometimes, you know, I think it's impractical sometimes uh, to obtain that kind of uh, supplementation from purely from diet. I'm going to try to uh, look at questions that are related to, to um, Inflammation, if that's okay. Uh, Could we ask the amount of lutein um, that you'd suggest in Zamazin? Well, I can't. I can't recall the exact milligram okay. amount off the okay. top of my head, but okay. it's it, the um, the correct amount is uh, in the AREDS two formula by uh, Bausch and Lomb Preservision. So this is a good question. I, are we really? No. Okay. You, you look through. I right. wasn't sure which <laughs> retinopathy of prematurity. So re that's a good Dr. Hartnett question. Yes, but Dr. Hartnett's not here. I know. Well, yeah. she was maybe going to be here, but it didn't look like she. So th this is a general question about retinopathy of prematurity. Uh, which, you know, Dr. Hartnett's actually an expert on that, but we know that uh, the risk factors for retinopathy of prematurity have to do with low birth weight and exposure to oxygen. So certainly, we, um, there's nothing you can do about low birth weight, and unfortunately, you're caught between a rock and a hard place where you have a low birth weight infant that, in order to survive, you need to supplement them with oxygen. Um, yes, oxygen is a definitive risk factor for, for that, as is um, uh, early gestational age. So um, a patient with B27-associated uh, disease, um, do you recommend uh, immediate family screening siblings? No, I don't think that that would make sense because 
Uh, it is not inherited uh, in, a, uh, in a manner that you're thinking of where, where it's dominantly inherited that it would definitely be present in, in every generation. Uh, family members are at risk for developing those things. If you were, if you have HLA B27 associated disease, um, members of your family may be at risk, but I don't think it is, uh, it makes sense to screen those patients with that test unless they develop um, symptoms that are associated with that. Uh, well, someone is asking why does the Navajo Nation have such a high rate of, of diabetic retinopathy, environment, diet, genetics? Um, I think it's a combination of all of those things. You know, in Saudi Arabia, there was a very, very high prevalence of, um, of diabetes that I think had to do with um, genetic uh, predisposition to developing the disease. Diet, for sure, has a lot to do with it. Uh, poor access to medical care, I think, uh, has. Uh, a lot to do with it, both in Saudi Arabia and in the Navajo Nation. This is a great question. What can I do to prevent my uveitis from coming back? Or to prevent or minimize the severity of it when it does come back? Um, I don't think there is anything that you personally can do other than to try to modify those risk factors that we know can be associated with inflammation. So there are, there are some patients uh, that uh, have kind of a crappy lifestyle, you know, in terms of their, what they, you know, smoking and drinking uh, and certain types of food allergies and things like that. I think certainly um, common sense modification of those risk factors such as uh, smoking makes a lot of sense. I do have some patients um, that have uh, modified their diet um, uh, to, there are some patients that have, uh, have gluten sensitivity uh, that they seem to have decreased uh, in the um, severity of their inflammation, but those are isolated cases. Um, I, I think that there isn't anything that one can specifically do to prevent it from coming back other than to be cognizant of the, um, of the signs and the symptoms of recurrent inflammation and to be seen uh, promptly should you have those symptoms or signs. Um, this same, uh, same person is uh, asking, you know, if you get UVS once or twice a year, will it continue the rest of your life? Um, well, you know, if I, I've got to polish my crystal ball a little bit here, but I think that uh, it's impossible to predict the future, okay? But I think that in general, um, inflammatory conditions tend to wane in time, okay? So as uh, our immune systems uh, kind of kind of wind down as we age a little bit, uh, so do the severity of certain types of inflammation. That being said, um, you know, uh, many, many patients uh, that have children with uh, inflammatory disease will ask that question, will my child have this forever? The idea is to prevent the inflammation that is present now from uh, causing structural damage to their eye later in their eye. And so we need to do whatever it is that we need to do in order to prevent that from happening. And if that requires uh, p placing the patient on an immunomodulation, then that's what we need to do. We w hope to induce a remission of that disease, and we hope that those children will outgrow that inflammatory condition as they get older. There is a subset of kids, okay, that still have that disease into adulthood. Um, so I, I think that, you know, you can make a generalization, but as I try to emphasize in this uh, in this talk, disease treatment is really individualized to the, to the patient. What is the difference between uveitis and iritis? Um, it is, there is really, um, in, the, in the, one of the slides that I showed you uh, before, um, uveitis is just a kind of a generic definition for inflammation in the eye. Iritis is um, a, a term that used to be used for inflammation around the iris. So that would be anterior type of, of uh, uveitis. So iritis is a form of uveitis that is confined to the front of the eye, or anterior uveitis. Uh, how does Humira work? Humira, Humira works by blocking uh, a uh, protein that is uh, 
that is thought to be instrumental in the uh, inflammatory pathway. So um, Humira works by blocking uh, TNF-alpha. That's how it works. Um, is TNF-alpha the only thing that's involved in uh, inflammation? It isn't, no. It, there are many other uh, uh, pathways involved. The immune uh, response is extremely complicated. Um, there are probably uh, other uh, molecules that could be targeted that are upstream of TNF-alpha that might actually be more eff efficacious. Um, and it is uh, for patients with uh, iritis uh, that is um, associated with spondyloarthropathy, so the B27 people in the room uh, that have multiple recurrences of this medication that may also have an arthritis that is associated with this. We know that Humira uh, or uh, Remicade is effective for their arthritis and that it reduces the, um, uh, the, the number of inflammatory recurrences and their severity by about 50 percent, at least in, in large studies that we know about. Um, for uveitis that is related to uh, juvenile arthritis, um, are there links to lifestyle and diet that can help reduce inflammation? Great question. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't think that there are. I think that there are genetic predispositions to developing this disease. Um, I think common sense approach to diet and things like that is important, but there isn't um, anything specific that I would do to change that. Many patients will, will ask me, is it stress? And well, yes, it is. Um, you know, stress is a part of life. Stress definitely uh, is an important uh, factor in the uh, psycho uh, neuro immuno axis. Uh, patients that experience great deal of stress in their lives sometimes will have uh, um, uh, episodes of inflammation. It's been a question that many people have been interested in for a long time. It's just very, very difficult to study um, how that, how to study that, because there is no real proxy marker for stress. I, um, someone is asking me, uh, Dr. Rip, uh, Mr. Rippey, uh, do you know, uh, do, do I work for the VA? Personally, I do not uh, work for the VA. No longer. So when I first got here, uh, I used to um, go over to the VA and see patients with uveitis and some retina, but mostly to try to uh, decrease the burden of uveitis. But there, uh, it became impractical to hold a clinic there because uh, patients came in so sporadically. So what we do is we just fee service patients from the VA to the Moran Eye Center. So uh, there's a patient that's asking about alternative uh, therapies, uh, aromatherapy, uh, oil, you know, oils and things like that for uveitis. Has that been applied for uveitis itself? Not in any controlled scientific uh, fashion, to my knowledge. There is a whole branch of alternative medication at the National Institutes of Health that are looking into things like that. It is very, very difficult, actually, to study uh, that uh, in an isolated fashion when, when we have other uh, therapies that are, uh, that are effective. Um, I have nothing against alternative therapies. Um, and I, but uh, I can't make a comment on whether or not they are effective or not uh, when we're treating patients with other medications. That's a follow up. Okay. Sort of. Oh, just kind of just help with B27 related uveitis and joint inflammation. Well, it might help you be less aware of it, um, but um, I don't, I, to my knowledge, it doesn't help therapeutically with the medication. You know? Or you may become more hyper aware of it. I don't know. So I don't mean to make light of that uh, because there is a, a lar large and emerging literature about the, uh, um, the, the uh, alleged you know, therapeutic benefit of cannabis in medicine. And there's, it's a real mixed bag, you know? It, it's really a mixed bag. Uh, you would have to smoke a lot of pot to get your, uh, your interocular pressure down in a consistent fashion. Why not just take it one drop a day, you know? Um, I, uh, in terms of chemotherapy, uh, it's uh, to treat uh, patients with, uh, you know, they're having side effects of chemotherapy, yes, uh, there, there's good, good studies to show that um, cannabinoids, okay, not necessarily, you know, uh, smoking you know, reefer itself is helpful for uh, 
you know, for nausea and things like that that are associated with that medication. All right. We've got to get you guys out of here. We're back on the show.